Hello, my friend. Welcome to your sleep story. My name is Stephen Dalton. I'm an Irish storyteller, and it's my great privilege to be the voice that you listen to as you go to sleep tonight. One of you recently suggested that I narrate some of Aesop's fables. The listener's name is Ashlyn, and I'm really grateful for the suggestion, so thank you. Aesop's fables are moralistic tales written a long time ago by Aesop, and there are many little tales that I have chosen to tell you tonight, each one with a little moral at the end. I really hope you like listening to them. One small thing, if my work is helping you and you'd like to support it, you can do so through Patreon. The link is below this video. Okay, let's do the relaxation session now, which will take a few minutes before tonight's sleep story. I'm going to count down from 10 to 1, and as I do, allow yourself to let go more and more. 10, 10, Feel the support of the bed beneath you, or the floor, or whatever you lie upon tonight. But beneath all of that, feel the earth, the earth that is always supporting you always there for you, our home, and as you become aware of that constant support, see if it allows you to let go a little bit more now to ease into this moment a little bit more now. Nine. You are safe. You are okay. And in this feeling of safety, in this place of comfort, allow my voice to be an anchor of safety tonight. Know that my voice will only ever take you to safe places, to safe destinations, to a safe refuge of deep sleep. Eight. Feel into your body now. Just notice anything. That's all you need to do. Maybe it's a tingling. Maybe it's a slight pain. Whatever it is, just notice. Maybe it's in your feet. Maybe in your legs, maybe your belly, your chest, or your face. And as you notice, whatever you notice, 
See if you're holding anywhere. And if you are, just let go a little bit more now. Seven. The day is done. Whatever has been, has been. Whatever will be, will be. But right now, in this moment, you don't need to think about the past or the future. Allow yourself the luxury of embracing this very moment. And of course, thoughts will arrive. And as they do, don't fight them. Know that they are a part of being a human being. Just see them for what they are. Thoughts. And watch them go. Like leaves on a moonlit river. Or clouds passing in a starlit sky. Six. This is your time. This is your moment. Nobody else's. We are best when we give ourselves time, when we allow peace to be a part of our experience of life. So allow yourself to let go, to be kind to yourself, To know that you deserve this moment and this opportunity of rest. Five. Peace lives within you. It's just waiting to be found. See if you can find it tonight. And if you do, where does it live? In your heart? In your head? Have a look for it and notice if you can sense it. Four, perhaps allow a little gratitude now. Gratitude for the simple things. The shelter you have tonight. The peace of this moment. The opportunity of rest. Three, begin to engage with your imagination now. Begin to see a world beyond your imagination, where all sorts of magical things can happen. Even talking animals. Really let go now, and let your imagination enter this fairy tale world. Two, 
Feel into your body one more time now. And just let go of any residual tension or anything you're holding on to. Your body has worked hard for you today. It deserves rest. One. Completely letting go now. As I tell you, tonight's sleep story. The town mouse and the country mouse. Now, you must know that a town mouse, once upon a time, went on a visit to his cousin in the country. He was rough and ready, this cousin, but he loved his town friend and made him heartily welcome. Beans and bacon, cheese and bread were all he had to offer. But he offered them freely. The town mouse rather turned up his long nose at this country fair and said, I cannot understand, cousin, how you can put up with such poor food as this. But of course you cannot expect anything better in the country. Come you with me, and I will show you how to live. When you have been in town a week, you will wonder how you could ever have stood a country life. No sooner said than done. The two mice set off for the town and arrived at the town mouse's residence late at night. You will want some refreshment after our long journey, said the polite town mouse, and took his friend into the grand dining room. There, they found the remains of a fine feast, and soon the two mice were eating up jellies and cakes and all that was nice. Suddenly, they heard growling and barking. What is that? said the country mouse. It is only the dogs of the house, answered the other. Only? said the country mouse. I do not like that music at my dinner. Just at that moment, the door flew open. In came two huge mastiffs, and the two mice had to scamper down and run off. Goodbye, cousin, said the country mouse. What? Going so soon? said the other. Yes, he replied. Better beans and bacon in peace than cakes and ale in fear. The Fox and the Crow A fox once saw a crow fly off with a piece of cheese in its beak and settle on the branch of a tree. That's for me as I am a fox, said Master Reynard, and he walked up to the foot of the tree. Good day, Mistress Crow, he cried. How well you are looking today. How glossy your feathers, how bright your eye. I feel sure your voice must surpass that of other birds just as your figure does. Let me hear but one song from you, that I may greet you 
as the queen of the birds. The crow lifted up her head and began to caw her best. But the moment she opened her mouth, the piece of cheese fell to the ground, only to be snapped up by Master Fox. That will do, said he. That was all I wanted. In exchange for your cheese, I will give you a piece of advice for the future. Do not trust flatterers. The Lion and the Mouse Once, when a lion was asleep, a little mouse began running up and down upon him. This soon wakened the lion, who placed his huge paw upon him and opened his big jaws to swallow him. Pardon, O king, cried the little mouse. Forgive me this time. I shall never forget it. Who knows but what I may be able to do you a turn some of these days. The lion was so tickled at the idea of the mouse being able to help him that he lifted up his paw and let him go. Sometime after, the lion was caught in a trap and the hunters, who desired to carry him alive to the king, tied him to a tree while they went in search of a wagon to carry him on. Just then, the little mouse happened to pass by, and seeing the sad plight in which the lion was, went up to him and soon gnawed away the ropes that bound the king of the beasts. Was I not right? said the little mouse. Little friends may prove great friends. The Swallow and the Other Birds It happened that a countryman was sowing some hemp seeds in a field where a swallow and some other birds were hopping about, picking up their food. Beware of that man, quoth the swallow. Why, what is he doing? said the others. That is hemp seed he is sowing. Be careful to pick up every one of the seeds, or else you will repent it. The birds paid no heed to the swallow's words, and by and by the hemp grew up and was made into cord, and of the cords nets were made and many a bird that had despised the swallow's advice was caught in nets made out of that very hemp. What did I tell you? said the swallow. Destroy the seed of evil, or it will grow up to your ruin. The Frogs Desiring a King The frogs were living as happy as could be in a marshy swamp that just suited them. They went splashing about, caring for nobody and nobody troubling with them. But some of them thought that this was not right, that they should have a king 
and a proper constitution. So, they determined to set up a petition to Jove to give them what they wanted. Mighty Jove, they cried, send unto us a king that will rule over us and keep us in order. Jove laughed at their croaking and threw down into the swamp a huge log which came down splashing into the swamp. The frogs were frightened out of their lives by the commotion made in their midst and rushed to the bank to look at the horrible monster. But after a time, seeing that it did not move, one or two of the boldest of them ventured out towards the log, and even dared to touch it. Still, it did not move. Then, the greatest hero of the frogs jumped upon the log and commenced dancing up and down upon it. Thereupon, all the frogs came and did the same. And for some time, the frogs went about their business every day without taking the slightest notice of their new king log lying in their midst. But this did not suit them, so they sent another petition to Jove and said to him, We want a real king, one that will really rule over us. Now, this made Jove angry, so he sent among them a big stork that soon set to work, gobbling them all up. Then the frogs repented when too late. Better no rule than cruel rule. The Ant and the Grasshopper In a field, one summer's day, a grasshopper was hopping about, chirping and singing to its heart's content. An ant passed by, bearing along with great toil an ear of corn he was taking to the nest. Why not come and chat with me, said the grasshopper, instead of toiling and moiling in that way. I am helping to lay up food for the winter, said the ant, and recommend you do the same. Why bother about winter? said the grasshopper. We have got plenty of food at present. But the ant went on its way and continued its toil. When the winter came, the grasshopper had no food and it found itself dying of hunger while it saw the ants distributing every day corn and grain from the stores they had collected in the summer. Then the grasshopper knew it is best to prepare for the days of necessity. The Tree and the Reed well, little one, 
said a tree to a reed that was growing at its foot. Why do you not plant your feet deeply in the ground and raise your head boldly in the air as I do? I am contented with my lot, said the reed. I may not be so grand, but I think I am safer. Safe? sneered the tree. Who shall pluck me up by the roots, or bow my head to the ground? But it soon had to repent of its boasting, for a hurricane arose which tore it up from its roots and cast it a useless log on the ground while the little reed, bending to the force of the wind, soon stood upright again when the storm had passed over. Obscurity often brings safety. The Shepherd's Boy There was once a young shepherd boy who tended his sheep at the foot of a mountain near a dark forest. It was rather lonely for him all day, so he thought upon a plan by which he could get a little company and some excitement. He rushed down towards the village, calling out, Wolf! Wolf! And the villagers came out to meet him, and some of them stopped with him for a considerable time. This pleased the boy so much that a few days afterwards, he tried the same trick, and again, the villagers came to his help, but shortly after this, a wolf actually did come out from the forest and began to worry the sheep. And the boy, of course, cried out, Wolf! Wolf! Still louder than before, but this time, the villagers, who had been fooled twice before, thought the boy was again deceiving them, and nobody stirred to come to his help. So the wolf made a good meal off the boy's flock, and when the boy complained, the wise man of the village said, a liar will not be believed, even when he speaks the truth. The Goose with the Golden Eggs One day, a countryman, going to the nest of his goose, found there an egg, all yellow and glittering. When he took it up, it was as heavy as lead, and he was going to throw it away, because he thought a trick had been played upon him. But he took it home on second thoughts, and soon found, to his delight, that it was an egg of pure gold. Every morning, the same thing occurred, and he soon became rich by selling his eggs. As he grew rich, he grew greedy, and thinking to get at once all the gold the goose could give, 
He killed it and opened it, only to find nothing. Greed oft o'erreaches itself. The fox, the cock, and the dog. One moonlit night, a fox was prowling about a farmer's hen coop and saw a cock roosting high up beyond his reach. Good news, good news, he cried. Why, what is that? said the cock. King Lion has declared a universal truce. No beast may hurt a bird henceforth, but all shall dwell together in brotherly friendship. Why, that is good news, said the cock. And there, I see someone coming with whom we can share the good tidings. And so saying, he craned his neck forward and looked afar off. What is it you see? said the fox. It is only my master's dog that is coming towards us. What? Going so soon? he continued as the fox began to turn away as soon as he heard the news. Will you not stop and congratulate the dog on the reign of universal peace? I would gladly do so, said the fox, but I fear he may not have heard of King Lion's decree. Cunning often outwits itself. The Wind and the Sun The wind and the sun were disputing which was stronger. Suddenly, they saw a traveler coming down the road, and the sun said, I see a way to decide our dispute. Whichever of us can cause that traveler to take off his cloak shall be regarded as the stronger. You begin. So, the sun retired behind a cloud, and the wind began to blow as hard as it could upon the traveler. But the harder he blew, the more closely did the traveler wrap his cloak round him, till at last the wind had to give up in despair. Then the sun came out and shone in all his glory upon the traveler who soon found it too hot to walk with his cloak on. Kindness affects more than severity. The man, the boy, and the donkey. A man and his son were once going with their donkey to market. As they were walking along by its side, a countryman passed them and said, You fools, what is a donkey for but to ride upon? So the man put the boy on the donkey, and they went on their way. But soon, they passed a group of men, one of whom said, See that lazy youngster? He lets his father walk while he rides. 
So, the man ordered his boy to get off, and got on himself. But they hadn't gone far when they passed two women. One of them said to the other, Shame on that lazy lout to let his poor little son trudge along. Well, the man didn't know what to do. But at last, he took his boy up before him on the donkey. By this time, they had come to the town, and the passers-by began to jeer and point at them. The man stopped and asked what they were scoffing at. The men said, Aren't you ashamed of yourself for overloading that poor donkey of yours and your hulking son? The man and the boy got off and tried to think what to do. They thought and they thought, till at last they cut down a pole, tied the donkey's feet to it, and raised the pole and the donkey to their shoulders. They went along amid the laughter of all who met them, till they came to the market bridge when the donkey, getting one of his feet loose, kicked out and caused the boy to drop his end of the pole. In the struggle, the donkey fell down and hurt himself. That will teach you, said an old man who had followed them. Please all and you will please none. The Miser and His Gold Once upon a time, there was a miser who used to hide his gold at the foot of a tree in his garden. But every week, he used to go and dig it up and gloat over his gains. A robber, who had noticed this, went and dug up the gold and decamped with it. When the miser next came to gloat over his treasures, he found nothing but the empty hole. He tore his hair out and raised such an outcry that all the neighbors came around him, and he told them how he used to come and visit his gold. Did you ever take any of it out? asked one of them. Nay, said he, I only came to look at it. Then come again and look at the hole, said a neighbor. It will do you just as much good. Wealth unused might as well not exist. Belling the Cat Long ago, the mice had a general council to consider what measures they could take to outwit their common enemy, the cat. Some said this, and some said that, but at last, a young mouse got up and said he had a proposal to make, which he thought would meet the case. You will all agree, said he, that our chief danger consists in the sly and treacherous manner in which the enemy approaches us. Now. If we could receive some signal of her approach, we could easily escape from her. I venture, therefore, to propose that a small bell be procured, 
and attached by a ribbon round the neck of the cat. By this means, we should always know when she was about, and could easily retire when she was in the neighborhood. This proposal met with general applause, until an old mouse got up and said, That is all very well, but who is to bell the cat? The mice looked at one another, and nobody spoke. Then the old mouse said, It is easy to propose impossible remedies. <laughs>